Are you tired of all the nitpicking and rumors surrounding the keeping of the biblical feasts? Oh my gosh, me too. <laughs> Since folks are uh, celebrating the, uh, well, most folks are celebrating the fall feast starting this weekend, I decided to tackle one of the more easily debunked theories about the pagan origins of the first of the fall feasts, which goes by a number of different names. Um, and we're going to talk about where a lot of this information that people get does and does not come from, because some of it, um, it's important to know sources, and a lot of people just say stuff, and people just say, well, they wouldn't say such a thing if it wasn't true. Well, you know, that's not true, and a lot of times there's stuff that's written down, but we don't know how to um, say, well, is this a valid source, or is this an invalid source? Are they just making claims out of nowhere? Have they studied this? Um, are we dealing with urban legends? Are we dealing with archaeology? So... Um, in this case, we're gonna we're gonna have a solid archaeological teaching. I mean, we're just it's yeah, we're gonna have fun. We're gonna have fun. Anyway, I'm Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I teach the historical and ancient sociological context of Scripture with an eye to developing the character of Messiah. If you prefer written material, I have five years worth of blog at theancientbridge.com, as well as my six books available on Amazon including a four-volume curriculum series dedicated to teaching scriptural context in a way that even kids can understand it. It's called Context for Kids. And I have two video channels on YouTube with free Bible teachings for both adults and kids. You can find the link for those on my website. Past broadcasts of this program can be found at characterincontext.podbean.com. All right, so there is a needless debate within some movements about supposed Babylonian origins of the upcoming Leviticus 23 Fall Feast, which goes by the names of Yom Teruah and Rosh Hashanah, but, you know, in reality, it's never formally named in Scripture. Um, unlike, you know, Pesach or Passover, Shavuot, which is also called Pentecost, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, and Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles. You know, the first day of the biblical month of Tishri is in many ways described, but it's never actually named. You go, don't just take my word for it. Go look. It's described. It's not named. <laughs> it's actually really cool. Um, it's described as a day of shouting or the sounding of the shofar, which is often translated um, trumpet in English. But there are two different kinds of trumpets in scripture one is the shofar and one is actually a metal trumpet something more like we would think of but you know this this holy day is never actually given a name which is why it's been labeled by people with names suited to its function in both the religious calendar of months and the agricultural civic calendar of years it so it doesn't have any wrong names <laughs> Just names that convey different meanings that are often misunderstood and misrepresented. I mean, we got to call it something, right? We <laughs> got to live. <laughs> got to have some sanity here. Now, um, Yom Teruah, with Yom bearing the Hebrew meaning of day, and Teruah being one of the sounds that is made by the shofar. It also means shouting. Um, the first day of Tishri is also called Rosh Hashanah. Um, Rosh meaning head, beginning um, of, um, of the year, Hashanah. And, and this is where much of the confusion comes in and accusations of pagan origins get made. So stick with me. The year beginning at this point, as opposed to the months beginning in the spring, is actually documented archaeologically. Ah, I haven't had my tea yet this morning. Bear with me. Uh, it's documented both archaeologically and biblically um, when we know what to look for. And, you know, when it comes to context, when it comes to reading about another culture, you know, we do, all of us, every single one of us, have to learn what to look for. This isn't elitism. This is just a, a recognition of the fact that we are 21st century people. And so we have a certain context, and it's not the same as theirs. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know, that's a learning curve. 
it's fun. It's fun learning about it. Um, now, I'm not going to go into every biblical instance because some of it requires more groundwork than I can lay out in this podcast, you know, over in an hour. But I will, and also cover all the other stuff I want to cover, but I will tackle the verses that back up the specific archaeology I'm going to cite here. All Bible references are from the English Standard Version. Um, okay, so let's look at Exodus 34, 22. You shall observe the Feast of Weeks. That's um, Shavuot. That's my little note. Okay, so you shall observe the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the Feast of the Ingathering at the year's end. Of course, the Feast of the Ingathering is another name for the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Okay, so they're saying that's, Exodus 34, 22 is saying that's at year's end. Leviticus 25, 3 through 4. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath, Sabbath, of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not prune, or sow your field, or prune your vineyard. Um, and and why I we're gonna why I cited that verse we're gonna go into here, verses eight through eleven of the same chapter. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you forty-nine years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month, Yom Kippur. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, when each of you shall return to his property, and each of you shall return to his clan. The fiftieth year is a jubilee for you, in it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself, nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines. So I have a few things here. Um, we see that the fall feasts are celebrated at year's end. This Hebrew word is tekupat, from the lemma tekupah, and serves as the direct object of the sentence referring to the end of the agricultural year. Forms of this word, excuse me, are only used three other times in Scripture, referring to the end of Hannah's pregnancy and the beginning of Samuel's life in 1 Samuel 20, the completion of the sun's circuit to the end of the heavens in Psalm 19.6, and designating the timing of Joash's assassination to the end of the year in 2 Chronicles 24.23. Each time it's used, it has the meaning of the ending of one cycle and the beginning of another, as in the case of Exodus 34, 22, which we read first. The beginning and end, or the end slash beginning of the agricultural year, which happened at the fall harvest and kicked off the season of our joy, when all the hard work of the harvest year was done and all that was left to do was plant the new barley crop, in anticipation of the early rains and whatever preservation work was required for winter. So it was the end of a cycle, beginning of a cycle, the agricultural cycle. We also have a different kind of New Year cycle celebrated in the month of Tishri and that is the um, Shemitah cycle. This referred to the seven year cycles of the land of Israel which go beyond the scope of this particular teaching um, but suffice it to say that each year in the seven-year cycle had specific commandments associated with it as far as the distribution of the second slash third tithe. The seventh year in particular was associated with release from debts and a freedom from all agricultural labors. Every seven years was even, uh, every seventh seven years, <laughs> Jubilee was even more significant as lands were restored to their original owners who sometimes had had to sell them off to pay debts. This all formally began and ended at Yom Kippur as we saw in the verses that I read earlier. So that was the beginning, or that was the end slash beginning of the Shemitah years and the, um, the Jubilee years 
So, yeah. <laughs> now, Tishri 1 was also the day that Israel's kings had their official coronations. And they counted their reign years according to this yearly event. For example, if a king died in the month of Elul, which is the sixth month, which um, we're in right now, his son would take the throne and would count the remainder of the month as the first full year of his reign. It's a very ancient Near Eastern thing to do. Just as his father also got a full year's credit for that 11th month, you know, year before his death. But he would not have his coronation until Tishri won. And there's really good reason for this. You'll be able to appreciate this. I mean, okay. That was when the animals were mature. The fattened calf was actually fat and still a calf. And all the produce was available for the event. Think about it. Who would really want to have their coronation in the spring when the only fresh crop was barley? Or flax. You know, what I mean? flax. You know, black. You know, not really a very glorious coronation right? No, you celebrate it when the harvest is in. So you can have a great feast. So, um, although we see in Exodus 12 too, that we have the beginning of months in the spring, marking the beginning of the religious year, the Israelites celebrated the beginning of actual years in the fall, according to the agricultural and civil schedule, as opposed to the Babylonians who celebrated their New Year's festival in Nisan the first month. But, you know, wait, there's more. <laughs> I can actually um, show you archaeological proof. Um, you know, found in a 1908 um, dig, archaeological dig at ancient Gezer, 20 miles from Jerusalem. This uh, 10th century... Uh, what they found was a 10th century BCE, so before the Common Era, calendar manufactured 200 years before even the Assyrian exile of the Northern Kingdom and 400 years before the Babylonian exile. It's a Paleo-Hebrew witness to the ancient year calendar at the time of the Davidic monarchy. So this is, was a huge archaeological find. Um, and uh, I'm going to take, you can find this, you can look it up, G-E-Z-E-R, um, look at the Gezer calendar. Just, just look it up and you'll be able to find a picture of it. Uh, I'm going to take the translation from Rainey and Notley's The Sacred Bridge, Carta's Atlas of the Biblical World. It's the gold standard of biblical atlases, um, which was uh, generously donated to my ministry by my anonymous benefactor, who I only know as Jennifer. So thank you, Jennifer. Everybody thank Jennifer. Anyway, so this Paleo-Hebrew calendar dated from the time uh, contemporary to David and Solomon. Okay, so line one says his two months in gathering, his two months sowing. Line two, his two months late sowing. Line three, his month, chopping flax. That one's important. Line four, his month, barley harvest. Again, there's a road there's a marker there. Line five, his month, harvesting and measuring. Line six, his two months, vine harvest. Line seven, his month, summer fruit. And it was signed, Avia. Now, Line one corresponds to the sixth through the ninth months on the Hebrew calendar. Line two to the late sowing of the tenth and eleventh months. Line three to the twelfth month, lining up perfectly with the Bible as we see Rahab in the first month drying the flax that was cut in the twelfth month. Line four corresponds to the barley harvest, which we all know happens in the first month. And then line five to the second month, line um, line six refers to the vine harvesting of the third and fourth months, and the seven line, seventh line wraps it up um, with the summer fruit harvest, you know, specifically olives. This is an agricultural calendar, arranging the months of the year according to what was happening in the fields. 
It begins with the ingathering at the end of the year, referred to by Exodus 34.22, and ends with the harvesting of the olives that would have been pressed and preserved as oil before the winter months of uh, rains and waiting. Okay. Now, ancient people thought of the world differently than moderns. Whereas we think in terms of calendar years starting in January, fiscal, fiscal years starting in April, election years starting in November, and school years starting in August and September. And, and I realized that I just was a very Northern Hemisphere centric thing because you guys in the Southern Hemisphere, you do it differently than we do because your your months, your, your times of year, just they're like the exact opposite. But you guys can adapt. You're all smart. You know. You know. Now, the religious year of months began in the spring month of Nisan. The civil year of um, second tide determination, debt remission, and kingship began in Tishri, the seventh month in the fall. The agricultural year began with the ingathering in the fall as the Gezer calendar showed us. And so, in the fall, Tishri 1 really can be called Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, and be an entirely accurate description. Remember, every name for Tishri 1 is a description. There is no name for it in Scripture. Um, you know, life radically changed in the fall. It was a time of celebration as the cycle of one agricultural and civil year ended and another began. The hard work, the back-breaking work of the year came to a close and they really were free to start celebrating the season of our joy. It's a time of great hope and anticipation and um, before the uh, early rains would come after Sukkot. That's actually something that, that I learned a number of years ago. A lot of people think that the um, early rains happen in the spring and the latter rains happen in the fall, but that's actually not true. The um, early rains um, start after Sukkot and the, the, um, the latter rains um, are more in the winter, spring. So it's, it's all tied to the agricultural harvest, not spring. Never, don't, don't pay attention to me. Okay. So, <laughs> Now, as for the claims that Rosh Hashanah has its origins and timing in the Akitu Festival of Babylon, that's what I wanted to talk to today. That's, it comes from something called higher criticism, and unfortunately it made its way into, I believe it was 1909 or 1910 that the Jewish Encyclopedia was written. And it has these sections called Lower Criticism, higher criticism and it just makes out these claims but it doesn't explain what lower criticism is and higher criticism is and so not understanding what that means people just say oh well that's the real origins but we're going to talk about the problem with that and um uh, very frustrating okay so i need to i need to explain what higher criticism is you know sadly it was a method of biblical criticism that was very popular in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century, but has now fallen into disfavor based on the absolute windfall of archaeological evidence gathered over the last 150 years. So lower criticism is also called textual criticism. It's a way of evaluating the biblical text using actual historical documents. Um, one, can, uh, one can use textual differences to uh, evaluate different manuscripts to see, you know, if there are errors, what changes have been made, that kind of stuff. It's useful when manuscripts don't match up exactly, as in the case between the modern Masoretic Hebrew Bible and the earlier manuscripts found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But lower criticism always uses actual historical archaeological evidence. Higher criticism, on the other hand, 
is a very subjective approach to the text that is highly dependent on theories and sometimes purely based upon wishful thinking. Higher criticism is based on some pretty significant assumptions and it has some specific agendas too. It challenges the legitimacy and authorship of the scriptures. According to much of higher criticism, the Torah was not written by Moses, who might have been nothing but a fictional character, but was penned during and after the Babylonian exile by various groups. Higher criticism is where the ideas of the Deuteronomy hypothesis, lunar Sabbath, and Babylonian Akitu origins of Rosh Hashanah come from. Higher criticism tends to want to find quote-unquote natural and, frankly, non-divine origins in everything. It's a very naturalistic, humanistic way of thinking. Um, it actively undermines the historical authenticity of the Bible's claim that it was written when it was claimed to be written and who, by who it was claimed to be written. Sabbath just has to be tied to the lunar cycles. It couldn't possibly be a, or divinely ordained, right? And the feasts need to be explained away as copies of Canaanite celebrations. Again, they can't possibly be of divine origin, no. According to this line of thinking, which I patently reject, obviously, or I wouldn't be doing this for a living. <laughs> Not that I'm really getting paid, never mind. <laughs> According to this line of thinking, the Jews in exile, desperately seeking to remain a people, wrote the Bible in order to give their beliefs more credibility and to give certain groups an authority. Um, it, it helped them stay in power. That's the nutshell view of higher biblical criticism. It's, it's a summary. It's also greatly affected many teachings about the origins of Christianity, many of which are based on unproven or disproven theories. It unfortunately just, it gave us this tendency to say, oh, well, that's what it looks like to me, and my theory, you know, is valid because I, the Holy Spirit will teach me what's, all things whatsoever. If something pops into my head, it couldn't possibly be biased or based on flawed understandings or a lack of education in an area. No, it looks like that to me, and so that must be it. Well, that's a form of higher criticism. And, um... Of course, as I was saying, the, the Jewish encyclopedia was written in the first decade of the 20th century before it fell out of favor. And it's really too bad because a lot of people, you know, they, they, they assume that the Jewish encyclopedia would be written by people who want to uphold the legitimacy of the Bible and everything in it. But that's not the way it was in the 18th and 19th centuries. You know, uh, I could have called it German higher criticism because it that's where it uh, it reached its zenith. And I flatly lay responsibility for a lot of the um, a lot of the persecution that came upon the Jews. I, I lay it at the feet of these higher criticism myths that that really uh, are oftentimes very anti-Semitic and give this idea that the Jews made up everything in the Bible just to bolster their power base, to, to encourage people to take them seriously, to um, justify their lifestyle and the leadership. And it, it takes the Bible out of the venue of being divinely inspired and handed down from God to certain historical individuals who, who really did exist, to just being a book of mythologies that has remarkable staying power. Well, I don't think, I can't think of any other book of uh, myths that has this much staying power. No, this is a living, breathing document, 
and uh, I can't even remotely believe that if it were illegitimate that it would have hung on for this long. Anyway, we will be back after a few minutes. Hi, I'm Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome back to Character in Context. This week, because the fall feasts are starting up, starting this weekend for most people, we are going, I'm, I'm trying to inject a little bit of sanity into the, um, in the discussions about the feast, because this is the time of year where there's a lot of infighting among certain groups because of supposed pagan Babylonian origins of um, Rosh Hashanah as opposed to Yom Teruah, and remember, this is a feast day that has no name. So it's not like we can even it's not like we can even say, well, they're calling it the wrong thing because it's described, but it's it's never named. So you know, we get these arguments. Well, it's based on the Babylonian Akitu festival, and it was pagan and that kind of stuff, but you know, like I was saying in the last half hour. That's based on complete, it's, it's completely unsubstantiated. It's purely theoretical. It's, it's German higher criticism, which sought to find naturalistic, humanistic, um, non-divine reasons for everything in the Bible from Sabbath keeping. It's where we get the higher, German higher criticism is where we get lunar Sabbath from. And, uh, and a number of other things, as well as the Deuteronomy hypothesis, which says that not, not one shred of the Bible was written until Babylon, the Babylonian exile. And then for not the reasons of, um, it's just, uh, you know, not only, I'm going to go back to, I, I was getting a little, not only is there no proof for uh Rosh Hashanah being of pagan origins, but there are there are factors weighing against it. First of all, I have no reason to believe that the Bible was first written during the exile. I believe that um, the Bible is telling the truth when it talks about Moses writing everything down. Heck, I believe that Moses, Aaron, Miriam, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all real people. I believe that the Jews celebrated the feast, all of them before the exile. I don't think that the priestly class created the Bible as job security. You can call those wild assumptions, but I presume that no one would take the time to even listen to me. If, uh, if they didn't take the Bible as a truthful document, I wouldn't listen to me if I didn't take the Bible as a truthful document. I'm really not that interesting. Anyway, um, Akitu was a 12-day spring barley harvest festival dedicated to the state god Marduk. It uh, began on the 21st of Adar and ended on Nisan 1, or on Nisan 1 and ended on Nisan 12. There's some debate among scholars with, um, with most, I believe, favoring the latter. This was the beginning of the year in the Babylonian Empire. So the Babylonian Empire did not begin their year in the fall. They began it in the spring. As a matter of fact, most ancient Near Eastern cultures did, with the exception of Egypt, which began their new year with the inundation of the Nile in the summertime. Um, but, uh, You know, the, the word Akitu itself, that everyone's, uh, everyone, <laughs> geez, Tyler, that um, some people say is uh, the inspiration for Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, is uh, actually related to the Sumerian word for barley, Akiti. I'm not, <sighs> you know, and, and the Akitu was called the barley cutting. Yeah, you know, that's what it meant. Compare it to Rosh Hashanah and the accompanying shofar blowing in the liturgies, I just don't see it. Akitu was in the spring, Rosh Hashanah is in the fall. Akitu was a seven or a twelve day festival starting in the twelfth month of Adar or on the first day of Nisan, and Rosh Hashanah is one day in the fall. Akitu was about the barley harvest, the lowliest of harvested crops, whereas 
Rosh Hashanah was celebrated in the time of wine, oil, and late fruits. At Akitu, the king of Babylon was subjected to a de very debasing ritual, which involved him being stripped of honor, dragged by the ear, and slapped. All grave insults in the ancient Near East, and Rosh Hashanah has no such equivalent. On the contrary, it was the day of ancient coronations in Israel. Akitu involved the parading around of the idol of Marduk, and on Rosh Hashanah we see no evidence that there was any sort of equivalent. I'm going to read a, a quick article here. It's from a, from a site that can be really great called Livius.org. It has a lot of ancient documents on it, um, but it also has articles um, written based on solid research. Um, this one uh, draws from uh, one of my favorite ancient Near Eastern scholars. He's also a biblical scholar called Karel van der Torn. He wrote the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible, which is a foot thick, give or take. And um, it's just amazing. He, uh, he, he, he is an expert in ancient Near Eastern religions. And that isn't to say that his book is perfect, because it was written 20 years ago. And since then, you know, archaeology is constantly coming up with new stuff. And so some of his stuff has been... Um, found to it's been needed to be update but still his work is monumental amazing he's an incredible scholar but that's why we do the archaeological stuff right because uh because there's always new stuff being found it's it's not static it's never going to be uh final at the same time unlike higher criticism <laughs> if we don't have evidence that something is true we can't say it's true Higher criticism made us so sloppy. Okay, so this article from Livius, L-I-V-I-U-S dot org. The name of Ketu is very ancient. In the third millennium before the common era, the Sumerian population of southern Mesopotamia celebrated the Akiti Sejurku, the festival of the sowing of the barley. It was, the, uh, it was celebrated in the first month of the year, that is March-April, in the Babylonian calendar. This month is known as Nisanu, and in the modern Jewish calendar, it's still called Nisan. Since the festival was celebrated on the first days of the Babylonian year, we call it a New Year's festival. In fact, the ancient Babylonians already called it Resh Shatim, the beginning of the year. So... Right there, we have the beginning of the Babylonian year is at the beginning of Nisan. The, uh, you, some people call it the month of the Aviv. It's the first month of the Hebrew calendar. The festival, uh, which should actually be called the conglomerate of festivities, was celebrated on two locations in Babylon, in the temple of the supreme god Marduk, the Esagilia, and the house of the new year, which was situated north of the city. The two gods who were in the center of the festival were Nabu and his father, the supreme god Marduk, who was in the first, first millennium BCE called Bel, um, which is our equivalent of Lord, Adon in Hebrew, Master, uh, Baal, because his real name was considered too holy to be pronounced. We're not going to go into that. On the 4th of Nisanu, the high priest of Esagila opened the festival, saying that the new year had begun. To the populace, this meant the beginning, and obviously, according to this one, it's uh, starting on the 4th of Nisan, which would put it as ending on the 16th. To the populace, this meant the beginning of a holiday of a week. At the same day, the king went to the temple of Nabu, where the high priest gave him the royal scepter. He then traveled to Borsipa, a city 17 kilometers downstream from Babylon and that had a famous Nabu temple. Here he spent the night. At the same time, the Sheshkalu recited the Babylonian creation epic, which is Enuma Elise, which I've talked about in teachings before, in the house of the new year. The fifth of Nisanu saw the king's return to Babylon, accompanied by the statue of Nabu from Borsipa. The statue was left behind in the Urash gate, and the king went to the Esagila 
to meet Marduk. He had to do this humbly, not as a king, laying down his weapons, crown, and scepter. The Sheshgalu listened to the king's words that he had not sinned against Marduk and hit him very hard on the cheek. The king had to have tears in his eyes for the blow to be legitimate. You know, perhaps this was a punishment for sins that were unwillingly committed. We don't know. The documents don't say. Kneeling in front of the statue of Marduk, the king receives an oracle about the glorious future and was given back his royal insignia. At sunset, the king and the Sheshkalu performed a not completely understood ritual with a white bull. Next day, the statue of Nabu visited the temple of Ninurta, where it defeated two enemies in the form of golden statuettes. Um, then it continued to Esagila, where it joined Marduk's statue. At the same time, other statues of gods arrived at Babylon from their own temples, obviously. On 7 Nisanu, the statues were cleaned and received new dresses. Did you know that? Did you know that, that, that idols wore clothes? Yeah, maybe we'll talk about that later if we have time. It's, it's, uh. On the next day, the, the festival reached its climax when all statues were brought out from their rooms and shown to the Babylonian populace. All gods were now present to honor Marduk, and their parliament announced its policy for the next year. One is reminded of the State of the Union speech by the American president. As far as we know, this policy was always one of blessing, fortune, and success. After these joyful tidings, the gods started a tour through the city to the river. Here they boarded a small fleet that brought them to the house of the new year. The king guided himself the king himself, excuse me, guided the supreme idol. On the last part of the route, the ships were placed on chariots so that the gods were driven to the house of the new year in ships. The people were singing all kinds of songs. Three of them can be reconstructed. A frivolous hymn to the goddess of sexuality and love, who's Ishtar. A song in which Marduk's father Enlil was ridiculed as a god in the gutter, and an antiphonal hymn in which the gods were asked why they were not in their temples, and they replied they'd been with Marduk. <laughs> now, what happened in the house of the new year on the 9th to 10th of Nisanu is not known, but it seems that sacrifices were made by the king, and the spoils of war were presented to the gods. On the 11th of Nisanu, the gods returned to the Esagila where they repeated their parliament after this, they saw Nabu off and went home. The Akitu festival continued for centuries, and not only in Babylon, um, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, and uh, get uh, this information um, from... I lost my place. Oh, you know what? It, it was close enough to the end. <laughs> I'm not going to find it again. So... In short, my point here is, did anyone read anything that sounded anything like the Rosh Hashanah as it is practiced on the first day of the seventh month by the Jews? No. I don't see anything, unless I am unaware of some traditions. But, I mean, they you see the eating of um, honey and apples. And hala, you know, because the, the Torah is sweet. And it, see, the uh, eating of the seven species. It, I, you know, I just, people say, well, there's a clear tie. What clear tie? It's not celebrated at the same time. A kitu means barley cutting. The barley cutting's in Nisan at the time of the Passover. I mean... I'm, I'm not going here, but if we really wanted to get technical, I suppose that if people are saying that the beginning of the year is in Nisan, then that's Babylonian, because they did it then. It, and I'm not saying that it is, but it makes a better argument than the first of uh, Tishri being a pagan new year, because 
the Babylonians didn't celebrate their new year then. They clearly, according to all the historical documents, celebrated it in Nisan, where the Hebrew, maybe that's why the Hebrew calendar, maybe that's why it says the beginning of months, to separate the religious calendar as being different from how the Babylonians and the other um, nations around them celebrated their new year in the spring. Yeah, it's, but it's all speculation, and we have to be careful with speculation because speculation almost always involves accusations. And when you're accusing somebody, you know, of paganism, uh, we just need to be really wary of accusations over the real origins, quote unquote, or this or that celebration or observance, because, you know, we're going to find the roots of those kind of theories in, um, in the very German higher criticism, which has come under scholarly disfavor and, and has caused a lot of problems, and especially a lot of problems for the Jewish people, and a lot of anti-Semitism. I'm just going to just write flat out and say it. And I, I know of people who will say Lunar Sabbath is anti-Semitic because it's saying that the Jews don't know when the Sabbath is, and they don't know how it's always been done. And But the same people will turn around and say, oh, well, this is based in a key to, well, based on the same source, higher criticism contained in an encyclopedia written at a time when higher criticism was still acceptable in scholastic and scholar, scholarly circles. I'm not going to say scholastic circles because I think scholastic circles actually should require evidence. We can't just make stuff up off the top of our head and um, and say, well, that has to be had where they really got it because we either have to accept the Bible is true or or just not. And if we're going to say that it was made up later and all these characters were mythological, then then why are we even studying it? it go study War and Peace, right? Honestly, um, you know, sadly it's become commonplace for people to float hypotheses, and it, I'm going to tell you something, this a key to origins theory isn't even a theory, it's a hypothesis. To have a theory, there has to be some sort of evidence. And you don't have the evidence of the length of the ceremony, or the time of the ceremony, or the purpose of the ceremony, or the contents of the ceremony. Can you imagine the high priest smacking David when he's, when he's assuming the throne so hard that he makes David cry? David was tough. I don't see maybe Saul crying because... <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Solomon, because Solomon, you know, he wasn't a man of battle, but it'd be pretty hard to make David cry. Um, so it's a hypothesis. There are no facts behind it. There's no evidence behind it. Okay, it's just a theory. And we can't just accept people's words for things and then go out and tell other people they're doing things wrong or they're doing things pagan or the Jews are pagan. The Jews care very deeply about this, all right? They take the feast very seriously, and they're not arguing with each other over all this stuff that we're arguing about. So I think maybe we better look at them and say, well, they're setting a better witness than we are, and when it comes to all this stuff, that's for darn sure. You know, but these hypotheses, they're, they're supposition. Superstition, even. <laughs> you know, others who read them, didn't always realize that they were untested opinions and treated them as fact because why would somebody write something in a uh, an encyclopedia that wasn't true? Well, unfortunately, it happens all the time. You see it in Encyclopedia Britannica a lot. They don't get they don't have experts writing their little um, their little blurbs. They have paid writers who sometimes get their information from sources that are not legit. There are legitimate encyclopedias out there where every, like, uh, if you get an Oxford encyclopedia, they have Oxford encyclopedias on different subjects, and they will have each of their entries being written by an expert in the field. But that's not what the case is with your generic encyclopedias. 
people uh, will often incorporate uh, urban legends into them because they are not experts in the field. Can you imagine rounding up experts and everything? It would be nice if it happened, but a lot of times it just doesn't. Anyway, um, you know, accusations of these sorts are, of paganism are serious business and should not be leveled at anyone or any group without some serious, rock-solid proof and not just suspicions. It's not enough to assume that there might be pagan origins of this or that. We have to know. The death penalty for idolatry in the Bible, you know, it, it's... It was the I mean, that's the penalty for idolatry in the Bible was death death. And anyone who made an accusation without first-hand evidence would be put to death themselves. We've grown so lazy, so lazy, and we've taken our American concept of free speech as a right to make accusations without any sort of proof, based on somebody who tells a convincing story. There is no proof whatsoever in the Babylonian origins theory of Rosh Hashanah. All we have are untested hypotheses that cannot be considered as anything more than opinions. So perhaps, you know, it would be wise to drop the ac accusations and vitriol concerning the feast and simply be glad when people observe the High Sabbath of Tishri 1, by whatever name they call it, honoring the King of Kings as a worldwide body. Oh, now I'm going to tell you my referenced works because this one is a little bit different than my normal ones. A lot of times I don't get, I mean, anytime you want my, my references, all you got to do is, you know, email me or whatever. But uh, so I already told you the Sacred Bridge, Carta's Atlas of the Biblical World. Remember, we got the um, Geza calendar, the Gezer calendar out of that one. And... Um, Carl Vandertorn, Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. I talked about that. That's, that's, that's a Brill book, so that's grotesquely expensive. Um, Benjamin Summers, the Babylonian Akitu Festival, Rectifying the King or Renewing the Cosmos. That's from the Journal of Ancient Near Eastern Society. Um, volume 27, year 2000. You can actually get that online. And... Um, I also used um, Sigmund Moenkel's The Psalms in Israel's Worship. It's from Erdman's 2004. Um, I get a lot of my information on um, coronation festivals from that. They have, uh, Sigmund Moenkel was an incredible, incredible scholar mid-century, and he is widely regarded as one of the world experts um, of all time in the Psalms, and so I highly recommend his book. It's it's good. But, you know, we're getting into this time of year where, where pagan origins, it's it takes the place of devotion. People preach it harder than they preach the Bible. But I, I want you to really think. You know, people tell these stories. Where are their sources? How far back do their sources go? Is there any actual archaeology behind the claims? When you're posting memes that says such and such is pagan, did you check out that information yourself? Did you ask for their sources? Did you read their sources? Did you read their sources sources? Because there's a lot of, I'm just going to be really honest, there's a lot of junk books. Because anyone can publish. Anyone can but, Trust me, I mean, no one's, I mean, I do have actually people reviewing my work, but but you don't have to have people reviewing what you write before you publish. All you got to do is um, submit it to a publisher. Um, and if you're self-publishing, you're paying for the copies yourself so you can write whatever the heck you want. Or uh, no one's fact-checking. And especially a book written by a nobody like me or other people who who do not have people checking checking up. There's no peer review. You don't have people who are actually scholars checking up on what I write because they don't know who I am. <laughs> I could get away with a lot of lies if I wanted to. And there are books out there that are frankly just full of made-up stories, urban legends, and you know, the people who write them may honestly believe them. 
But believing something is not the same as it being true. And you, when you're going to make charges that are claimed to be based in archaeology, the archaeology needs to exist. And with this Babylonian Akitu myth, it absolutely doesn't exist. And it's caused way too much friction and anger among believers and between um, people in the Hebrew Roots movement and, and the Jews. So uh, let's be careful.